Descended from the noble houses of Sereno, the boy Dooku was turned over to the Jedi Order at an early age and quickly distinguished himself as a prodigy. Though he trained under various masters, his primary instructor was the Grand Master himself, Yoda. Passing his trials and ascending to knighthood, Dooku grew into one of the Order's greatest swordmasters and academics, and was even invited to join the Jedi Council, though he turned them down. However, he was also an outspoken maverick, furious about the various political and social injustices perpetrated by the ailing Galactic Republic. Though much more tactful than his student, Qui-Gon Jinn, he was still a major cage rattler. However, he was also nearing the end of his rope, with Jin's death at the hands of Darth Maul during the Naboo Crisis being the last straw. Resigning from the Jedi Order, Dooku was approached by the reigning Dark Lord of the Sith, Darth Sidious. The Dark Lord claimed to share Dooku's views regarding the state of the galaxy, and convinced him to join the Sith as Sidious's apprentice and help him reform galactic society by tearing down the Republic. Dubbed Darth Tyrannus, Dooku reclaimed his ancestral title as Count of Sereno and used his family's wealth to form the Confederacy of Independent Systems, an alliance of disenfranchised star systems and corporations fed up with the Republic's corruption and stagnation, instigating the Clone Wars. The conflict allowed Sidious, as Supreme Chancellor Palpatine, to militarize the Republic and centralize its political power, giving him absolute control and paving the way for the rise of the Galactic Empire. However, Dooku didn't live to see the rise of Emperor Palpatine, as he had ultimately been recruited as a mere placeholder for Sidious's chosen successor, Anakin Skywalker. Pitted against the young Jedi, Count Dooku was defeated and beheaded at Sidious's command. Darth Sidious ascended to power as Galactic Emperor mere days later, and Anakin Skywalker became Darth Vader, Iron Fist of the Empire, while Dooku was remembered as nothing more than a failed revolutionary and a traitor. The son of Jedi fugitives during the Dark Times, Galen Merrick was abducted after the death of his family by Darth Vader and trained as a Sith apprentice. Stripped of his birth name, Starkiller served as Darth Vader's personal enforcer, killing both traitorous officials within the Galactic Empire and surviving Jedi, with the ultimate goal of standing by Vader's side against the Sith Master himself. Instead, he was betrayed by Vader, as Palpatine had discovered his existence and ordered his death. Vader made a show of executing Starkiller, but afterwards retrieved his body, reviving and rebuilding his broken apprentice. Starkiller was presented with a clean slate and a new mission statement. Assemble a rebel army to distract Palpatine and his spy network, allowing Vader and Starkiller to catch him unawares. Starkiller was successful, but he was in for another bombshell. Vader had merely intended to use Starkiller as bait to draw out the various rebel leaders so they could be more easily captured. He had never intended to use Starkiller against Palpatine. Infuriated by these repeated betrayals, Starkiller rejected the Sith, reclaiming his birth name and self-identifying as a Jedi. Galen Merrick resolved to rescue the rebel leaders, using his powers to track them to the still under construction Death Star. Carving his way through the station, Merrick confronted and defeated Darth Vader, but was then approached by Palpatine, who offered him Vader's position as his true Sith apprentice. Refusing Palpatine's offer, Merrick attacked the Emperor, ultimately sacrificing his life to allow the rebels to escape in the chaos. In the aftermath, the Rebel Alliance made Galen Merrick a martyr, taking on the Merrick family crest as their emblem, whereas Darth Vader retrieved Merrick's corpse, using his genetic material to create a line of clones, looking to recreate his apprentice with the genuine intent of using him as a weapon against Palpatine.
I'm going to start this off by clarifying a few points. Firstly, I will be acknowledging Dooku's appearances in Star Wars The Clone Wars, though I will be regarding the series purely as a supplementary source, with my analyses being drawn primarily from the classic expanded universe, the so-called Legends continuity. While his appearances in TCW are consistent with his established skills and powers, he, like every other force-wielding character featured in the series, is seriously underpowered. Secondly, as before, my analyses of Galen Merrick is going to be based off of a compromise between the depiction of his powers in the various versions of the Force Unleashed video game and the descriptions provided in the novelization. So Legends continuity is going to be taking overall precedence within this video. Accordingly, if you are a pure film fan or have completely bought into the new Disney continuity, you would do well to be on your way. So with all of that out of the way, let us begin. Count Dooku and Galen Merrick, two of the most formidable Force adepts of their respective eras. If these two titans ever met on the battlefield, who would win? As a young Jedi trainee, Dooku was the most gifted student of his generation, a natural talent with the lightsaber. Taking full advantage of this aptitude, he developed into one of the greatest swordmasters in the history of the Jedi Order and an extremely prolific lightsaber instructor. However, after his fall to the dark side of the Force, these skills were turned against his former brethren, and many Jedi fell to his blade. Dooku's chosen fighting discipline was Makashi, the second form of Jedi lightsaber combat. An ancient fencing style, Makashi was developed specifically for lightsaber dueling, and was at one time the most common fighting style in the Jedi Order. It was ultimately rendered obsolete and phased out due to the widespread emergence of blaster technology which made Dooku's choice to specialize in a blade-to-blade -blade fencing style in the age of projectile weapons a very unconventional move. Additionally, Dooku also possessed an advanced level of skill in the remaining six lightsaber forms, capable of serving as an instructor in any of them and ensuring that he knew how to engage and counter all of them. However, Dooku viewed the hybridization of techniques with disdain, seeing this practice as compromising one's overall skill level due to the fighter spreading himself too thin amongst too many styles. While I have no doubt that these alternative forms were an unconscious influence on how he developed his own style, the idea of Dooku actively employing anything other than Makashi in live combat is downright laughable. Accordingly, Dooku's personal technique represented the core elements of Makashi elevated to the nth degree. His was a linear cut and thrust style based around precision, control, and fluid swordplay. Form 2's inherent emphasis on efficient, minimalist movement made the style easily sustained in the long term, making it an excellent choice for an older man like Dooku, as the physical demands were so minimal. In fact, Dooku was often so relaxed when fighting that observers have noted that he appeared to be dancing. One of the primary elements of Mikashi, and one that Dooku adhered to strongly, was the emphasis on developing unique movesets, avoiding predictability and improving combative flexibility by steering clear of textbook techniques. As a result, Dooku demonstrated a number of skills and attributes not normally associated with Form 2 lightsaber combat. He was highly effective on the battlefield, combating multiple assailants with little difficulty, and even performing blast deflection, overcoming one of classical Mikashi's major shortcomings. His technique was further rounded out by his skillful integration of both force-based telekinetic strikes and physical combat techniques. It is quite clear to anyone with even a basic understanding of swordsmanship that the core concept behind the Makashi form 
is that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Accordingly, Dooku was very linear and direct in both style and tactics, though I have to stress that he did not meet opponents head-on with direct offense, and all of his attempts to do so have failed miserably. Rather, Dooku was all about taking the path of least resistance, using lateral movement to stay out of the opponent's line of attack whilst keeping them in his. In keeping with this, his offense was based around bypassing and undermining the opponent's guard, not overwhelming it, while his defense was based around deflecting and evading the opponent's attacks, not stonewalling them. Of worthy note is the fact that Dooku rarely assumed a dedicated offensive or defensive posture, instead relying on a push-and-pull mixture of advance and retreat, giving way before an opponent's attack and then darting in to strike at an exposed flank, avoiding head-on engagements by preventing them from gaining an offensive or defensive foothold. This objective of undermining the enemy heavily informed Dooku's conduct in battle. He used telekinesis to bypass his adversary's defenses with additional lines of attack, and in so doing demonstrated his penchant for further undermining the enemy with diversionary tactics and psychological warfare. Remember what I taught you, General. If you are to succeed in combat against the best of the Jedi, you must have fear, surprise, and intimidation on your side. For if any one element is lacking, it would be best for you to retreat. You must break them before you engage them. Only then will you ensure victory and have your trophy. I find this statement to be an excellent summation of both Dooku's strengths and weaknesses. The threat Dooku represented was based around his ability to keep his enemies off balance and prevent them from bringing their full power to bear. But his emphasis on this approach was based in large part on his own inability to handle a head-to-head -head confrontation, especially in his old age. As his final duel with Anakin Skywalker proved, when put between a rock and a hard place with no way out, he crumbled under the pressure. However, this weakness, serious though it may be, should not be seen as detracting from Dooku's skill or his accomplishments. He is his era's reigning master of Makashi. He has effectively engaged many of the greatest sword masters of his day. As Qui-Gon Jinn observed, he was a fencer through and through, leverage, position, and advantage being as natural to him as breathing. Count Dooku was not a rock come to crush you. He was water come to drown you. In contrast to Dooku, Galen Merrick was not particularly well known, having spent most of his life living in absolute secrecy. However, he still stood as an extremely well-trained and accomplished duelist, with experience against some of the greatest swordmasters of his era. When training his apprentice, Darth Vader applied the lessons that he had learned from his own failure on Mustafar. Rather than allowing Merrick to become an over-specialized offensive duelist as Anakin Skywalker did, Vader used grueling sparring matches, both with himself and Merrick's combat droid proxy, to force him to develop a more balanced, improvised style. Only after Merrick had established his own methods did Vader provide him with formal training in the Seven Forms. Whereas Dooku dedicated himself absolutely to the study of Makashi, Merrick followed through on his initial training and studied an array of complementary forms that covered all of his bases. His primary disciplines were Forms 3, 5, and 7. Incidentally, the same lightsaber forms traditionally associated with Sith warriors and strongly advocated by Darth Bane in his manifesto, The Rule of Two. Merrick's application of Form 3 was an imitation of the Obi-Wan Kenobi combat module employed by Proxy and provided him with a good general purpose defensive style that was effective in all situations. Form 5 was likely a holdover from Vader, who was a Dejemso specialist, 
though Merrick instead dedicated himself to the Xi'an variant, as indicated by his preference for the reversed grip and his skill with aimed blast deflection. Form 7 was the backbone for Merrick's offensive technique, allowing him to more effectively bolster his combat effectiveness with the Force. As Zhu Ya was such an advanced discipline, only advanced masters of multiple fighting techniques were capable of effectively studying it and applying it, giving us a window into the true breadth of Merrick's skills. Furthermore, as all students of the art were approaching it with entirely different skill sets and backgrounds, no two applications would ever be the same, and Merrick was no exception. In contrast to the more renowned Form 7 masters, Darth Maul and Mace Windu, Merrick was detached rather than emotional, with lightsaber combat being more of a technical exercise for him. Galen Merrick's overall technique was dynamic and elaborate, with a good balance between strength and agility. His extremely well-developed stamina made his energetic style viable in the long term, and he demonstrated a high level of precision. As a raw swordsman, his primary asset was his versatility, but therein lies his weakness. Like a traditional Nyman specialist, his wide array of complementary skills meant that none of his techniques were advanced to the master level, which was a serious liability against an opponent like Dooku. As a dedicated student of a form dedicated to blade-to-blade -blade combat, Dooku had anticipated and developed counters to all possible lightsaber techniques and variations. For those of you who see his final duel with Anakin Skywalker as refuting this, one need only look more closely at that fight, as well as the relationship between Forms 2 and 5. As depicted in the Revenge of the Sith novelization, Dooku was actually able to effectively counter Anakin Skywalker's application of Dejem So and undermine Skywalker's resolve with psychological warfare, and had it not been for Palpatine's intervention, Dooku would have no doubt won. Secondly, as Form 5 lightsaber combat was created through a hybridization of Mikashi and Sirisu, Dejem So has a direct relationship with Mikashi, the most obvious tie being the shared emphasis on lightsaber dueling. However, while the Gem So's focus on power moves is a tick in its favor, I see it as being more of a contributing factor rather than the primary reason for the Gem So's advantage over Makashi, as we have seen Dooku effectively engage other strength-oriented duelists, simply deflecting the power blows. Entering into the realm of speculation, I see the main element that the Gemso shared with Mikashi as being the focus on linear dynamics, an element that is basically unique to these styles, as all other lightsaber forms were based around circular dynamics, emphasizing the cut over the thrust. However, the crucial difference is that where Mikashi was all about staying out of an opponent's line of attack and bypassing their defenses, the Gem So was all about the head-to-head -head confrontation, and would be actively countering the Mikashi specialist's attempts to bypass him, something that no other lightsaber form does, as they're not designed with linear dynamics in mind. While Galen Merrick does possess skill in Form 5, he has dedicated himself to Xi'an, which is derived more from Sirisu and doesn't employ linear dynamics. And as with all of his other techniques, he simply hasn't developed it to the point where it can threaten Dooku. In most situations, his solid integration of physical combat techniques and heavy integration of force-based attacks would go a long way towards compensating, but again, these are skills that Dooku employs. The only trick of Merrick's that I see as being even remotely effective is channeling force lightning along his blade as he strikes but even that would be little more than a one-hit wonder, as Dooku would adjust and counter. Galen Merrick's tactics were where the influence of his master was most evident. Consistent with the typical MO of Form 5 specialists, he was all about enduring and powering through. 
defending against whatever his foes threw at him and immediately retaliating with overwhelming force. Like Vader, Merrick had a heavy emphasis on pattern recognition, initially relying on a cautious probing offensive to get a feel for his opponent, but then countering with whatever configuration of skills he deemed appropriate. For example, in his fight with Rom Koda, he met the Jedi General head to head, either stonewalling his assault with a Sarisu style defense or countering with his own dedicated offense, whereas against Shock T on Felucia, he mimicked her hit and run tactics while directing Force Lightning into the Mega Sarlacc Maw upon which they fought to break her footing and knock her off balance. Having been trained by his master to rely on his surroundings to distract and ambush. The problem here is that Dooku relies on very similar tactics. Best case scenario for Merrick, they cancel out. Worst case, and more likely in my view, Dooku being much more experienced counters Merrick's tactics while continuing to effectively employ his own. And as previously mentioned, Merrick's hyper-adaptive improv foo approach works against him because, like a traditional Nyman specialist, he has spread himself too thin. Like Darth Vader, Merrick has optimized himself to exploit predictability, as almost every Jedi prior to the Purge had dedicated themselves to developing highly consistent, reliable fighting forms, falling into the trap of becoming inflexible and predictable enslaved to form. And this right here is something that Dooku has dedicated himself absolutely to overcoming. He may be consistent, but he is not predictable, and he has proven repeatedly that he can effectively combat everything that Galen Merrick is bringing to the table. This advantage is further reinforced by Dooku's specialized weapon, a curve-hilted fencing lightsaber. The pistol grip handle fits better into the palm, improving leverage and control, as well as bolstering Dooku's cut and thrust moveset. While Merrick's more utilitarian weapon, originally Rom Koda's and adopted after the loss of his original lightsaber, is certainly well made, it doesn't provide the same ergonomic advantages. The one thing that I need to be clear about is that this doesn't mean that Merrick is helpless as the manner in which he has developed his skill set means that, while he isn't a great swordmaster, he is a threat to great swordmasters. A single mistake, a moment's inattention on Dooku's part, would spell instant death. However, this doesn't change the fact that the Count has the odds stacked in his favor. Count Dooku gets the edge as a martial artist and lightsaber duelist. Count Dooku was a well-built, though slender, human male who stood at 6 foot 4 inches, exceptionally, though not abnormally tall by human standards. 83 years old at the time of his death, he was considered venerable, though he was also noted as being in better shape than many men half his age. His physical prime may have been far behind him, but he retained respectable levels of natural agility and dexterity which bolstered his fighting style, though his strength and stamina were negligible. Fortunately, his use of Makashi went a long way towards compensating for this, as his emphasis on efficient deflection and undermining minimized physical strain, his relaxed movements allowing him to fight almost indefinitely under ideal circumstances. However, when put between a rock and a hard place, the old man crumbled under the pressure. Unfortunately for Dooku, Galen Merrick was handcrafted to keep up the pressure, whether receiving or dispensing. Also a human male, Merrick was either in his late teens or early twenties and was just entering his physical prime. Slim but muscular, his primary attributes were his agility and stamina, capable of fighting non-stop for hours on end. His already impressive capabilities were pushed to the next level by his physical reconstruction on board the Empirical, to the point where he was able to survive being crushed by a heavy stone table, 
coming away with just a few cracked ribs rather than being killed outright, and recovered within the space of a week. Merrick has his limits, but considering what it took to finally kill the bastard, he is not going down quick no matter who he takes on, and his physical superiority over Dooku is unquestionable. Galen Merrick gets the physical edge. Just as with lightsaber combat, Dooku was a prodigy, the most gifted student of his generation, and again he took full advantage of this aptitude, developing into one of the most powerful Force adepts in the history of the Jedi Order. However, his cynical nature and lifelong fascination with Sith lore ultimately led him down the dark path. He believed that by holding to his principles and keeping a firm handle on his emotions, he could control and wield this power safely, but the corrosive influence of his master twisted him into a stone-cold, murderous psychopath. Though these tendencies made him a monster, they also bolstered his growth and development as a Sith Lord. Dooku was already a master of telekinesis as a Jedi, even instructing classes on the use of the power, but his training in the Sith arts made it into a terrifying weapon. Basic pushes and pulls allowed him to thrash or manhandle targets, and on one occasion he even pulled an enemy onto his lightsaber blade. He has used force grip to choke people out, throws to utilize loose objects as deadly projectiles, and he had mastered personal levitation. In all of his powers, Dooku emphasized focus and precision over brute force, but that didn't mean that he couldn't overwhelm adversaries through sheer magnitude when the situation demanded it, unleashing force waves powerful enough to scatter large groups of enemies or shoving around freighters like a child's toy. He has demonstrated that he can also contend with powers of similar magnitude, whether simply evading them or tanking them outright with his own robust telekinetic barrier. Furthermore, he has proven that he can reliably penetrate the barriers of opposing Force adepts, ragdolling his various Jedi adversaries on a fairly regular basis. Dooku's lethality was further heightened by his use of Force Lightning. He could lash out at both lone and multiple targets with enough intensity to kill or incapacitate immediately, though he often favored using it as an instrument of torture. On a more positive note, he once utilized it as an improvised defibrillator to keep the grievously injured General Grievous alive. Dooku supplemented this power with Tutaminus, and is at the very least capable of deflecting lightning of his own magnitude, and presumably capable of deflecting blaster bolts as well. In addition to these various combative powers of attack and defense, Dooku was highly skilled at using the Force in a more utilitarian manner. He was instructed in the arts of Sith sorcery, and has participated in Sith rituals with Palpatine. Possessed of highly refined telepathic abilities, Dooku was capable of influencing the minds of weak-willed subjects and controlling the minds of beasts. He was a capable practitioner of the Sith Kuei Tech Meditation, which was used to conceal one's Force signature from other Jedi. While this power allowed him to avoid notice, he could be found out by those who were actively looking for him. He has used the Force to cleanse his body of poisons and diseases, most notably purging the Karatos Plague from his body after Jango Fett exposed him to it to try and leverage him. While he failed to accomplish this when injected with a Night Sister poison that dulled his senses, I believe that that was because he wasn't given sufficient time to muster his energies, as he was attacked almost immediately. His use of physical augmentation was largely tailored towards compensating for his old age, primarily his lackluster stamina, hence his focus on enhanced reflexes and agility. Dooku's overall use of the Force was defined by his emphasis on precision and minimalism over raw power, maximizing his overall longevity and making him that much more dangerous. 
a dagger in the night rather than a crashing boulder. He was a tightly focused powerhouse with a good balance between combative and utility powers. Galen Merrick was unquestionably a prodigy who enjoyed a raw, primal connection to the Force that allowed him to develop into a highly formidable combative adept, though I still contend that the common perception of his abilities is inflated. Essentially, I see Merrick as being all flash, no bang. The average Jedi Padawan is capable of lifting and moving several tons of weight with telekinesis when given the chance to concentrate and gather his energies, and Merrick has simply refined this skill to the point where he can do this on a whim with little effort. He hasn't actually increased his own inherent power levels, he has just learned how to use what he has more effectively. He's fast, not strong. This is best represented by his inability to directly contend with the powers of other adepts. He is incapable of penetrating the telekinetic barriers of even low-level Sith acolytes, and his own defenses are absolutely pitiful, a weakness that obviously places him at a serious disadvantage against Dooku. Merrick's most dramatic results were always due to skillful application rather than brute force, bypassing an opponent's defenses with telekinetic throws and lightning, overwhelming them with a quantity of diverse attacks rather than a masterful application of any one ability. By the standards of Sith combat specialists, Merrick's skill set was rather basic. Telekinesis, lightning, mind tricks, and physical augmentation. As mentioned, his telekinetic powers had a massive amount of kinetic energy behind them, sufficient to scatter large groups of enemies and devastate his surroundings, and capable of lifting and throwing objects weighing hundreds of pounds with casual ease, but as I also pointed out, he was incapable of overcoming the telekinetic defenses of other adepts, and had to rely on more tactical powers to get around them the aforementioned force throws, as shields only cancel out telekinetic influence and not momentum, surges directed into the ground to disrupt an enemy's footing, or targeting environmental hazards as a form of ambush. The problem here is that Dooku relied on similar tactics, which, when combined with his more focused and substantial power, provides him with a substantial advantage over Merrick. And this imbalance is not corrected by Merrick's energy-based powers. Galen Merrick's applications of Force Lightning have been no better than Dooku's, the only possible advantage he has being a broader range of application. The most notable of these, and likely the only relevant one, is how Merrick has effectively weaponized the interaction between Force Lightning and the lightsaber, channeling the energy along his blade as he strikes, allowing it to discharge off of the tip and further damage whatever he is striking, as well as practically tripling his effective lightsaber range. However, Merrick's offensive viability is again undermined by his compromised defenses. While he clearly had some skill with Tutaminus, he was only capable of containing and directing the energy when subjected to it. He wasn't able to prevent it from harming him. A weakness which contributed to his death and puts him at a further disadvantage against Dooku. There is comparatively little to say about Merrick's alternative abilities, as his understanding of the higher mysteries of the Force was relatively limited. After he rejected the Dark Side, he gained the ability to voluntarily employ Farsight, a power that he had struggled with all his life as Vader's apprentice, and used it to locate the Death Star. Merrick was also adept in the use of force-based telepathy, using basic mind tricks to influence weak-willed subjects to do his bidding, and on the massive scale, using it to spread confusion and disarray amongst enemy troops in battle, though this power would be of little use against a powerful Sith Lord trained to resist such influence. In contrast to his other powers, there isn't much to say about Merrick's application of force-based physical augmentation. It's a very narrow power intended to serve a very specific purpose, and it doesn't really leave any room for alternative applications. 
You can tailor it to suit your needs, but you can't really use it for anything other than its intended purpose. He is capable of the superhuman feats of speed, strength, and agility that are necessary for the study and practice of Jedi and Sith martial arts. Nothing more and nothing less. At the end of the day, Galen Merrick was very much Darth Vader's student, displaying a wide variety of influences in his approach, successfully marrying a Sith-style emphasis on brute force with a Jedi-style focus on utility and tactical ingenuity. But while he was unquestionably powerful, he wielded his powers too broadly, lacking the focus and precision demonstrated by experienced masters like Dooku. Just as with lightsaber combat, Merrick's jack-of-all-trades skill set and flexible applications of his powers means that he is a serious threat to great masters like Dooku despite his relative inferiority. But again, Dooku's knowledge and finesse wins out. Count Dooku gets the edge as a force wielder. As the nature of Galen Merrick's training was to allow him to contend with force adepts and lightsaber duelists of greater skill and power than himself, there is no question that he would be a threat to Dooku. However, Dooku's basic advantage over Merrick as a duelist carries over to all of their skills. Merrick's entire approach to combat was based around using his hyper-adaptive skill set to find the one form of attack that his opponent can't effectively defend against and then spam the hell out of it. An approach that was very ineffective against Dooku due to the very nature of Makashi. A dedicated fencer understands that there are only a finite number of attacks that can be employed with a bladed weapon, and he works to anticipate and counter all of them. A mentality that Dooku has applied to both lightsaber combat and force powers. Just as there is only so much that can be done with a lightsaber, there was only so much that could be done with telekinesis and lightning. The only thing that Dooku had true difficulty contending with was a master level application of a single given technique, something that was beyond Merrick's ability due to his jack of all trades skill set. Merrick's force abilities may have been more overtly powerful, but he wielded this power too broadly, lacking the focus and precision demonstrated by Dooku. Aside from a few tricks, Merrick wasn't packing anything that Dooku hadn't already proven that he could deal with, and everything that Dooku was bringing on had that level of focus and amplitude that Merrick has repeatedly shown a vulnerability to. Simply put, Dooku had a significantly greater level of refinement and skill than Merrick in practically every field. And Merrick's physical advantage is not enough to turn this around. Almost every opponent that Dooku engaged during the Clone Wars was of greater physical ability than himself, and he still boasted an excellent track record. If this were a war of attrition or a no-holds-barred beatdown, Merrick would have the advantage, but Dooku would not allow the contest to degenerate into such a brawl. His surgical approach would instead allow him to keep Merrick at arm's length while he efficiently fended off his attacks and dismantled his defenses. To reiterate my first point, there is no question that Galen Merrick would be a threat to Dooku, as he was clearly a prodigy and likely had the potential to surpass the count. But end of the day, all he could be relied on to do would be to contend with this adversary. I see this fight as playing out very similarly to Anakin Skywalker's first duel with Dooku, particularly as described in the Attack of the Clones novelization. Merrick would definitely acquit himself very well in this contest, and would no doubt impress Dooku with his capabilities, but he would ultimately be soundly defeated. 
I don't normally do narrative style verdicts, so this will be new territory for me. To set things up, the Battle of Geonosis has just begun, and Dooku has just arrived at his secret hangar and is preparing to leave. But rather than being confronted by Kenobi and Skywalker, it is Galen Merrick who enters. Without a word spoken, both combatants draw their lightsabers and begin circling. Where Anakin Skywalker charged like a bull and got a face full of lightning for his trouble, Merrick advances cautiously, coming on fast but holding some back, more interested in getting a feel for this foe rather than scoring hits. However, Dooku would be doing the same thing, and he would immediately recognize Merrick as an inferior lightsaber duelist and press this advantage, deflecting Merrick's assault and retaliating with consummate ease. Sensing Merrick's struggle to keep up, Dooku would likely throw in a calculated taunt, criticizing Merrick's lower caliber of swordsmanship. Ignoring the comment, Merrick keeps his cool and changes his game plan, hitting Dooku with a force push to give himself some breathing room and follow this up with a more committed assault, working in telekinetic throws and lightning to break Dooku's rhythm. Dooku would initially assume a dedicated defensive posture, elegantly and methodically evading and deflecting Merrick's various attacks, re-establishing his tempo before responding in kind. However, the good count would be holding back, his retaliatory offensive not intended to overwhelm, but to goad Merrick into ramping things up. Taking the bait, Merrick hits Dooku with everything he has. An erratic lightsaber assault with Zhuya, integrated telekinetic strikes and throws plus lightning, including that little trick where he channels lightning along the length of his lightsaber blade as he strikes. And through all of this, Dooku again resorts to a defensive posture, fending off his assault with ease while assessing the full range of Merrick's capabilities and adjusting his own tactics to counter. Working in his own attacks, Dooku would fall back on his customary mixture of advance and retreat to yank Merrick's chain and throw him off balance. Merrick wouldn't be overwhelmed outright, but he wouldn't be able to make any headway, and his defenses would be coolly and efficiently dismantled by the Elder Sith. Merrick's defeat would be quick and almost anticlimactic a momentary defensive lapse, allowing Dooku to score a decisive blow, amputating one of Merrick's limbs, and finishing him with either a thrust through the heart or an execution-style beheading. Thus, I declare Count Dooku the victor.